people say, oh, why are you so passionate about climate action or social action, social justice action? And to be honest, I'm not passionate is, is you know, is a responsibility. <laughs> I don't have the luxury to focus on something else because when you see inequality increasing, when you see the effect of uh, uh, climate change, you know, um, happening all around the world, then the only responsible thing to do is, uh, especially if you're in a privileged, you know, position in a country where you can do something, then you have to do something. And that's why I do what I do. <laughs> Dr. Sabrina Chakori is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine, sponsored by the Lojas Regenerative Foundation. Sabrina is a researcher at CSIRO, the Australia's Science Agency, an associate lecturer, University of Queensland, founder of the Brisbane Tool Library, Post-Growth Institute Fellow, and Sabrina holds a PhD, obviously a doctor's, in, uh, as well as a BSc in biology at the University of Geneva, an MSc in environmental economics, the University of Queensland. And she really focuses on using a systems approach and all she does in her PhD work and the research that she does. Sabrina explored packaged food reduction and food systems. Her work provides an understanding and repositioning of the socio-materiality of food packaging, politicizing packaged food, and highlighting the need to pursue degrowth strategies to increase the sustainability of food systems. As I mentioned, she is part of the Post-Growth Institute Fellow, a winner of the 2020 Creative Change um, Seven Young Achiever Award, that's a mouthful, and recipient of the Emerging Female Leader Buseri from the National Council of Women in Queensland in 2020. Sabrina is a multi-award social uh, winning a social entrepreneur, researcher, educator, and dedicated activist. She's been doing this quite some time, believe it or not. She looks young, like she's just a young spring chicken. Sabrina is full, fully invested in creating systemic change that will build a more socially just and ecologically sustainable degrowth society. Sabrina has been advocating for more sustainable societies, leading numerous collaborations in various countries. For example, to translate the practice her knowledge and vision, in 2017, she founded the Brisbane Tool Library, a social enterprise that encourages people to borrow tools, camping gear, and other equipment. This community-driven circular model reduces productivism and consumerism. The Brisbane Tool Library is Australia's first and only library of things to be located within a public library, State of Library of Queen Queensland. And Sabrina has also co-founded the Degrowth Journal, which with a collective that aims at changing the academic culture, decommodifying knowledge and supporting slow science. Welcome to the show, Sabrina. Good. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> it's, it's so good to see you. And, and uh, I actually could have gone on quite a bit more on uh, you've been studying and doing this for quite some time, but I watched your TED talk. I've seen some of the photos around and you actually started pretty, pretty young. I would say at a pretty young age, uh, you were born into, uh, inherited a lot of this climate crisis and problems that we have at a young age. What sparked you to go off on to these degrees and these studies and to be so interested in climate activism? Yeah, so as you said, uh, I'm already part, you know, I like to remind people about it, that I'm already part of the generation who inherited these complex socio-ecological uh, challenges. I have um, born in 92, which was the first uh, climate summit in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And, and the, the importance of that date, and, you know, the, which is the year where I was born, is to remind people that 
we have been discussing this problem for quite a while, you know, with the Club of Rome publication, you know, uh, limits to growth in the 70s. So it's nothing new, unfortunately, but I still uh, feel that there's the tendency to uh, often speak about the future generation that will be impacted by these effects of uh, climate change and uh, social inequality and social injustice. But um, sometimes these you know, talking about future generation is just a way to postpone the problem, to postpone action. So it's a good reminder to, you know, to say, hey, we've been talking about it. The science has been clear and, and we're still stagnating in business as usual in all aspects of society. <laughs> And personally, well, you know, uh, people say, oh, why are you so passionate about climate action or social action, social justice action? And to be honest, I'm not passionate is, is you know, is a responsibility. <laughs> I don't have the luxury to focus on something else, because when you see inequality increasing, when you see the effect of uh, uh, climate change, you know, um, happening all around the world, then the only responsible thing to do is, uh, especially if you're in a privileged, you know, position in a country where you can do something, then you have to do something. And that's why I do what I do. <laughs> That that's fabulous. Yeah, the the first Rio, well, I believe, um, was very pinnacle. But nineteen ninety two, Severin Suzuki, I believe, spoke at. Um, I don't know if you know who who she was. I think she was twelve years old at the time and spoke at uh, that conference, and it was really a a groundbreaking moment. Um, but there are so many wonderful things going on, and as you said. Um, they're all kind of coming to a head and they've been around for a long time. The limits to growth books been around 50 year anniversary is this year. And you have some unique connections there that we're going to kind of try to tickle out uh, there that that uh, uh, roundabout connections. And also Stockholm plus 50 was just barely uh, not too long ago in, in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. The 50th conference of one of the very first climate conferences uh, around as well. That is really heartbreaking that we've been doing this for so long. And, and sadly, I'm sorry, we, we uh, you've inherited this. I've never heard it before been said like like you said it that it's not a passion. Uh, you and basically inherited this, and there's really no other other way you can do. Um, anything else so um how how did that path or journey start did it was there anything specific to, towards that that got you interested in to start studying those things i mean i mentioned that you were uh the school of agriculture and food sciences and and uh had all these ties not only to food agriculture but systems and and doing other things and other circular degrowth slow models out there in the world. How did that all come about? Was it just a, something else that we're missing? No, I should, you know, reflecting back at when I really started to be involved in so-called activism, even if, to be honest, I don't like to use the word activism or activist because it almost uh, indicates that most of people are passive and, and it's all the opposite people. Everyone is active, you know, and everyone has an impact. And the only, you know, we use this definition to say, um, just that activists know their power, they are uh, aware of the power that they have, contrary to maybe people that have other priorities or obligation. Um, I think I had an evolution in my, let's say, activism life to keep this term or career or study path. I think I started from being a very uh, environmental, environmentalist focused activist. And then I, I couldn't focus in my 20s, I couldn't focus on one subject, on one theme, right? I was worried about the Great Barrier Reef, uh, as well as uh, deforestation in the Amazon, in Borneo, uh, as well as, you know, extinction of other species. And there were many problems at that time that, that were like, you know, floating in my head. So I had to take a step back and start reflecting on what was causing all of these problems, you know, because at the same time, you know, uh, I was seeing all this migration coming, you know, from North Africa and Africa, all the, the victims of the Mediterranean um, Sea. And, and so there was all these social and ecological 
problems that they were interlinked somehow. But at that point in my 20s, I couldn't point out, you know, the root of the problem. So stepping back uh, a couple of years and you know, doing more in-depth research and study, well, it's pretty clear and obvious from the, the science, but also from, you know, uh, all the literature that it's out there, that the current economic system, which is, you know, based on economic growth, on capitalism, is at the root of all these problems, you know, because uh, the IPCC reports, they mentioned that they, we live in the Anthropocene, the, uh, the human age that has an impact on the environment. But really, I, I like to adopt more the definition of capitalism. We are in the age of capital, you know, uh, of capital accumulation. And because we are so growth driven in our society and we can unpack what that means, um, we are externalizing all these social and ecological costs, which then obviously have the consequences that we can see and read about. And so um, because I couldn't choose one specific niche topic, I decided to tackle the root. And the root is that we urgently need to change the socioeconomic system you know, uh, existing in place internationally so that we could build a, an economic system that you know, works for social and ecological well-being and not just uh, for profit. So uh, you, you have a you, you know you have a lot of degrees. You've studied a lot. You're still working at the university level and doing a lot of things on that. Is that necessary um, to do what you do? Is it really necessary for the majority of people to be concerned or care about the environment and make a change? Does it help anymore? Um, I, I kind of just want to know how how. Uh, if that's given you more empowerment or better tools to address this on a political level, on an economic level, in different sectors to, to bring things, um, uh, new systems that make the old ones obsolete um, into place, or, or has that hel helped in any way, or is it necessary? And I want, kind of want to know, um, not just the yes or no answer, but a little bit more what your feelings are on that, because some people... Um, get really overwhelmed when they're looking at the existential crisis and climate and all those things. They're saying, well, I have to go get a PhD or I have to get a master's in this, and then I can start to talk about it or, or act upon it. Yeah, it's actually a very you know, fundamental question, which often links also to the question that you know I get asked uh, should we you know change should change start top down or bottom up where do we need you know and um, I like to think about the fact that we don't have that uh, you know time anymore to choose where change needs to start we need to to make it happen wherever we are um, I will answer at two levels to your question so the first one is do we need all these degrees and you know this education this uh, bureaucracy you know around having titles uh, yes and no I mean obviously those titles are just titles but they represent a background and knowledge of work in there but um, on a level as a woman especially in that you know we're, we're in parallel to capitalism we still have a, a strong patriarchal society so uh, I, every woman in the world if it has degrees it you know it gives a bit of um, more power to speak about these issues but aside from that um, I don't think that you know university education is the only way. In fact, I spend most of my time and, you know, my PhD supervisor, as well as all my professor I had in my life, they know that most of my time was, you know, uh, um, most of my energy was um, put into outside of academia work. I think that what we really need, and I think the most powerful leverage points I find in my own personal path, and it might be different for everyone, is actually working as a community. In the sense that often we think that we need to tackle these you know, uh, issues as individuals, and that can get overwhelming. You know, It can get really overwhelming to think that you need to make your shampoo and cycle to work and, and uh, grow your tomatoes and do all of these things while you know, being constrained by the current system, which means you need to pay, uh, uh, you know, a rent, a mortgage, you still need to pay for, you know, the um, 
the, the current all the bills. So within the current system, acting as an individual can get very overwhelming. And that's probably why a lot of people feel powerless. You know, they're like, well, if I can't grow my tomato, then I'm not living a sustainable lifestyle. So I'm gonna give up on cycling and everything. And, and that has to be a knowledge. This is, you know, uh, unfortunately through all these, you know, 50 years, if we take the limits to growth publication as a, a milestone, we had these very greenwashing campaigns that they wanted to neoliberalize climate action. You know, you as an individual, you can do that. You have a ecological footprint as an individual, but that's, I think is a very, um, dangerous path to go through. What we have to learn is to uh, relearn as, how to act as collectivity, as community, you know? And I think with my work with the Brisbane Tool Library, I learned that, you know, for, I just take a ba basic example now. If you reconnect with our neighbors in our street, in our suburbs, you know, you might uh, make the bread and I might grow the tomato, or, you know, you might deliver uh, something to me and I might bring your kids to school. That collaboration is the only key you know, uh, to find some structure of change and that collaboration as a community level, then it can be scaled up in, you know, recreating the commons or as we do at the tool library, recreating organization where community gets together to, you know, manage resources. So I think that beyond titles and, you know, everyone starts where, you know, they can with what they have. And, and as I said before, I've been privileged enough to have access to, you know, uh, education in, in global north country which is as well you know an important privilege to acknowledge so I do what I do but I think that the most powerful parts of my work has been to learn how to collaborate to catalyze change as a community not as an individual I absolutely love that and uh, I, I'm trying to I try to start out our podcast very slow kind of tickling the surface and working our way deeper but what most people don't know is that there's a lot of depth and substance in, in you as an individual, but in the work and the things and the thoughts uh, 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 that you research and the things that you do and write about. Um, you wrote a beautiful section for a collaborative book, Menu B, uh, Regeneration, Global Food Systems Reformation. Uh, and and uh, I really appreciate, I'm so honored to have you there. And it was really tied to a little bit of the work that you, you do with agriculture, food and sciences. But just in this last little section that um, as you answer that question for me, a lot of things have come out. And so we're, we're going to have to kind of dive into those because they're so vital. I, I tickled a little bit that, you know, the Limits to Growth uh, book came out in 1972 and there's some ties there. The ties are systems thinking, the ties are food, the ties are um, degrowth, the ties are many of those words that, that you've talked about, and systems thinking. Uh, Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, your Grander, Steve Barron's Jr., who wrote Limits to Growth, were not only created the world model three, but systems dynamic modeling, systems thinking is great from Donella Meadows, but you apply all of those factors into your life, not just your work and your research, but into your life. And uh, I, uh, not too recently, uh, heard you speaking, and I, I belong to the Systems Dynamic Society in Germany, but also in the world uh, um, globally. And I, I, I want to know what did you talk to them about? You gave them a nice lecture and I, I guess a, a presentation and talked to them about some things. I wanna know what you talked to them about. And I wanna then go deeper into the, all the things that you just brought out, degrowth, the economics so capitalism and how, how we need to get off of this degrowth, what is the right uh, economic model? And then, uh, and then I wanna go into a little bit deeper, but first I wanna start out kind of how we reconnected through the uh, Systems Dynamic Society and what you talked to them about, which is really interesting because it's something that, even though it's 50 years old from the limits to growth, not a lot of people are applying systems thinking in, in a lot of areas of things they do. So I want to hear more about that and how you got into that and how, how that whole thing has kind of evolved. Yeah, so for me, 
Um, so let's start by saying that, you know, system thinking, system dynamics are just methods. And sometimes we uh, give too much importance to the method itself, you know, but it's a method to understand a problem. It's a method to frame a problem. And for me, when I came across this method the first time, it was very uh, eye-opening because uh, we tend to be hyper specialized, especially in academia on one, you know, small thing, which is good because we have experts, you know, that come up with drugs that, you know, solve many diseases and stuff. But sometimes because of these, uh, uh, segmentation also of education, we, we miss the larger overview of the system. So for me, using those methods was really important to unpack the problem that I first analyzed with my uh, PhD, and then you know I use those methods for other problems. But just to give an idea of what I discussed at the System Dynamic um, Conference, so I looked at food packaging as a problem, and it's a problem that we, you know, we read about a lot. The UN came up now at the beginning of the year in March with a new end plastic pollution draft resolution. So, and it seems a very superficial problem, right? We are overproducing packaging, overproducing plastic, which is the main material used for a special food packaging. We need to solve it, but it's not happening. The, you know, the logo, the recycling logo has been run for 40 years. Recycling is not happening for various reasons. Some might argue that recycling is not happening because of technical issues, which is true because sometimes when we reuse too many times the materials, they lose of quality, etc. But let's be honest, recycling is not happening because it's not profitable enough. In fact, you know, European countries uh, send, you know, their waste, plastic waste, as well as e-waste to other global South countries that have less infrastructure, <laughs> just, you know, to discard of their waste. So basically, we live in this uh, society where everything is disposable and we don't know anymore what to do with the end products, right? And I looked at the food packaging, but it's interesting because through my research, I was like, okay, what, what does food packaging represent, right? Because we also, again, you know, I was mentioning before how we individualize the problem, we blame consumers, you know, you have to recycle properly, you have to learn where to, you know, um, put your packaging but really the problem is a more systematic one and my research and my publication show it so first of all people when go to you know shops supermarkets they don't go and buy packaging they go and buy packaged food so there's already a shift in the conversation right what do we buy what do we find in on you know supermarket shelves and we find packaged food and you know from processed to fresh food is more and more packaged and you know the data shows that since the 60s, uh, packaging uh, increased exponentially. So once we understand that the real problem is packaged food, then we unfold the problems like, why do we have you know, so much production of packaged food? And I, I, using system methods, I show that we have three main subsystems influencing society and therefore influencing the food system. First of all, globalization, you know, with the introduction of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, you know, free trade agreement increased again through countries, we import and export products all over the world, which can be a good thing if it's, you know, a global uh, trade that is necess necessary. But unfortunately, globalization, again, is growth driven. You know, we, we when I say we, is countries, companies, you know, companies uh, export and import to increase profits and government incentivize global trade to increase GDP, gross domestic product. And, and we can mention right now that, you know, we're talking about uh, growth. When I say, we live in a growth driven society. It means that the main index to um, measure the well being, so called well being of our society, remains GDP, the gross domestic product. And so our governments change laws and regulation and incentivize commerce of specific products just to increase this index that doesn't account for the ecological and social costs, right? So if you look at food system, back to our main problem is we have a global market that might not be that necessary, right? And when I say might not be necessary, people would argue, yes, but we need these products. But really, we could relocalize food system. We could eat seasonal food products. We don't need to import and export those products all year long. And 
to increase GDP, we have also what is called intra-industry trade, which means that countries import and export the same product. For example, the US export beef to European countries and import beef from Argentina and other South American countries. So we can understand that our globalization, our global market is not um, need-based, but is profit-based. So that's the first part, you know? And when we start understanding that globalization is a big thing and we can't ignore it, then we can understand why we need that packaging, you know, why that packaging is used. We don't need it, but it's used because supply chain are very long and complex. And of course, food needs to be protected. So we already are shifting the conversation from the poor consumer that just, you know, find that packaged food at the end of the supply chain to an entire market that it's based on the profitability of that packaged food. The second subsystem is that with urbanization and the supermarket models, we indeed change the way we consume food. And I'm just 30, but you know, if we ask our you know, grandparents, they didn't have you know, the, the supermarket model that we have now. And we can see again that since the 60s, then it accelerated around the 80s, there are more and more brands on the same supermarket shelves, right? So we go in to buy cereals or something, and we find so many brands of the same product. Therefore, companies have to compete you know, for consumer attention. Some data, they show that uh, consumers spend maximum like 29 seconds choosing a product, right? So packaging suddenly is not anymore just protecting food, but it became an important marketing tool, right? And, and companies spend a lot of money in that packaging, you know, um, marketing. So here we see another, you know, uh, level of why we have so much packaging. And the third one, which is a more a micro level subsystem, I looked at how and why people in, indeed purchase, you know, uh, packaged food. And sometimes uh, they don't have other, you know, choices or because of how our, you know, food system is designed and our cities are designed. But also we, we talk a lot about, you know, poverty in general or income poverty, but what's uh, happening, especially in Western countries and slowly affecting also, you know, global South country is that we live in a society that suffers from um, time poverty. And, and this time poverty, uh, you know, is influenced by many factors such as, you know, people having to work many jobs to have, a, a, you know, a, a minimum of prosperity. So that's, you know, there, there's an increasing of working poor, um, working poor class. Um, there's the, the composition of family changed a lot with, you know, more single parents or double parents, you know, uh, in a families, both parents work. So, Composition of family change, but many factors influence this time poverty, which leads then, you know, to purchase uh, ready to consume food, you know, frozen food, easy to cook uh, food. And, and obviously when we say easy to cook, easy to consume food that is packaged. But again, the problem is not people buying it, but is that time poverty that drives people to buy those food. So we, when we look at the, this big system, then recycling doesn't even even coming into the conversation because it's just a post-consumer problem. And, and that is just a small example on how, you know, food packaging is mentioned a lot. And we think that just by collecting few pieces on our walk to the beach, you know, we can help. But really what we need to, to think about is why our society works like this and why our food system are designed and what's the purpose of our food systems. And our, the purpose of our food system is mainly to increase capital uh, for big companies and more and more, you know, um, centralized food company, food corporations, and not anymore to provide healthy and affordable food for people. I totally agree. It's actually uh, another form of commoditizing uh, food in, in a lot of respects. We see some of the uh, effects that Ukraine is having on food and agriculture currently um, because food has been turned into a commodity and when you cheapen food you cheapen life and it's really a sad thing you brought up a couple of things uh, that I want to touch upon or maybe see if you have want to go in a little bit deeper so in 2018 all international organizations the WTO the UN, the World Economic Forum, uh, World Health Organization, all international major organizations switch to a systems view of life approach to solving human suffering and our global grand challenges. 
And what I mean by that is a systemic approach to solve our problems. And in the beginning, you kind of, you, you mentioned this, and I, I want to say it in a little bit different way. You, um, I want to say we have, we've, up until that point in time, humanity has really been taking a linear or siloed approach at solving a lot of our human suffering and global grand challenges. We focus in on water or focus in on, on packaging. But just as you even told that story, you realize that the packaging is a huge system that ties to many, many aspects. And I love how you unpack that to show us all the facets in, in a very complex system. And where, where is the real problem line? This, you know, post-consumerism uh, issue and it's, and it's time issue. And there's many things that came out there. When people sometimes hear systems thinker and think about uh, this, this whole process, they're thinking like big government or that's a system or this, you know, this, there's, some other kind of system or a computer system. They don't think about the thousands to hundreds of thousands of systems that are operating every day in each one of our lives and industries and things. And I, I really um, strongly believe and have seen the results that when we take a systemic approach to solving human suffering and our global grand challenges, we get a lot closer to solving or eradicating those problems and getting humanity on the right side of history. We also tackle the growth issues. We also tackle the economic issues because we're addressing every facet of, the, of those systems in order to do it instead of just saying, we just need to throw more money at it or we just need to fix the water. And so I love how, how, how you say that, but I also wanted to just kind of go in a little bit deeper on exactly what, what I, when I hear you speak, what I hear out of it and, and uh, how, how that's such a beautiful thing, because it's still, even though it's emerging and we're 50 years now, the limits to growth and systems thinking and, and that um, uh, it's, it's hard to see it applied or talked about so that people can get a good understanding of how complex that is. Uh, the, the last thing I want to say about it, and maybe you could you could uh, bring this out in your thoughts or feelings as well. A lot of people think it's too complex or it's too hard to, to think in systems. Um, and we do it every day. It's actually easy. And a lot of those things are autonomous. They're just on autopilot and they will happen naturally. But if we understand it's a system and that we have to do all these things in order to solve the problem or to address it or to have the system flow smoother, um, the better life goes, the better things work. And I wanted to see if you've experienced that as well. If you've taken this systems approach or in ways that you, you address things and you say, wow, that's just a better model that works a lot better. And it's also tackling the problem. So I wanted to see what your thoughts and ideas and if you've run into that as well. Look, I think that, you know, obviously we all function differently. And again, some people might be more, you know, able to understand the working system and others, they prefer to, you know, focus on a specific part of the system. And, and that's fine. And that's, you know, maybe go, goes back to that redistribution of task and collectivity, you know, because, you know, if I think about the system I just mentioned about a uh, packaged food, right? Okay, that's the problem is that we have a growth driven, profit driven food economy. What do we do about it, right? And, and you know, if someone asked me, how can we reduce food packaging? I would say, well, if you just want to focus on one thing, then let's fight for a basic income. And people would go, what do you mean? What's the, you know, what's the connection? And, and or, you know, or work sharing mechanism, because if we free up people time, then people can indeed cook, you know, from raw ingredient, you know, from fresh unpackaged food. And that's one connection. And we need, you know, a bunch of people to just work on that, you know, until we bring up that at a higher level. Uh, 
another solution that could you know reduce packaged food is we need people to fight or at least to be vigilant about which new free trade agreement or existing free trade agreement we have in place so again you know instead of having these greenwashing campaigns if a turtle choking on a plastic bag or something we need people to understand that our government sign up you know free trade agreement every year and then re they revise them so we need to change that um the the other problem about you know systems is uh, especially from an academic point of view is obviously systems are just a tool to frame a problem you know they are oversimplified version of the system so sometimes we get back into trying to understand or argue that you know that system is not accurate because one connection doesn't lead to the other or is not a causal connection but again as i said before it's just a method now i think we have all the knowledge you know from the ipcc reports to all the amazing scientists out there is just that we need to get organized and we can't get organized because we are crushed by the current system you know even in academia let's be honest about it you know uh, universities have less and less funds it became very competitive to to just survive in academia and we have this you know uh, publish or or die system that you know we don't have time to do quality research anymore because we 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 are pushed as for the gdp growth you know to just measure how many publication we have and not the quality of them so we just have to slow down the entire system and and i might be a bit critique you know you mentioned them um, the great or they look a great initiative of the UN or you know I can see also you have the badge of the sustainable development goals and I know you work in there and again I think this idea of shifting the conversation to tackle social ecological issues from a holistic perspective is fundamental and it's a big change to the conversation right but at the same time government uh, as well as you know all the international organization the aim at increasing gdp so if we don't change that we won't change anything and and the sdg as well you know um if i'm correct and probably people in in the net they can correct me if i i i'm mistaken but the sustainable development goal number eight is economic growth so if we just aim at achieving that we can externalize all the rest you know the other goals come after that so it's interesting how growth itself is a goal and you know it's not just a way to achieve social and ecological well-being so we need to be critique about our institution and our government and and that's probably the only way to then apply this systematic change yeah, absolutely. If there's any that I um, struggle with the most out of the, the sustainable development goals is the, that exact one of, of economic growth. Um, and I wrote for the United Nations a sustainable development goal manifesto. And in that manifesto, I, I actually changed that SDG to say sustainable economic growth or regenerative or resilient economic growth, depending on which manifesto you, you read. And I think that's it's really important. And, and this is a perfect time to get into degrowth and economics and, and kind of talk a little bit about that because it's not only tied to, to what we just discussed, but it's tied to pretty much everything. So. A lot of people haven't heard that the SDGs are an entirely new economic system. They're like, what? I thought that was just an add-on to business as usual on a, some goals. But actually, it's set up um, with, nine. I think it's 94 trillion US dollars to reach the SDGs by uh, December 2030. And there's a huge economic shift that occurs if we do that. Um, so they are an entirely new economic system if we choose to, to use them and adapt it. I'm with you 100% and, and uh, on degrowth, um, um, post-growth from Tim Jackson uh, um, as a wonderful friend of mine and a wonderful book and, uh, uh, as well. And I, I really want to talk, how did you get into the whole degrowth? How, how is the publication going and what you write about that? And what, what got you on that path? And let's, let's break it down and talk about that a little bit more. Because we've kind of tickled on it with some, 
some statements, but uh, we need to go a little bit deeper. Sure. Um, so first of all, if we you know, once we understand that economic growth is a problem, then, you know, the next question is what's the alternative? Or why? Let's start first with the why economic growth is the problem. And the problem is that we keep, you know, as we said, uh, fueling the economic metabolism of our society, but we live in a planet with limited resources. You know, there's the planet boundaries, uh, nine or 10 of them have been ready. Nine of them, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we cannot continue, you know, to expand the economy on a planet with limited resources. So a knowledge of that then is like, how can we reorganize everything? And, and, and you said, you know, you mentioned the word degrowth and post growth, basically they mean the same thing. Um, maybe post growth is a bit more politically correct because degrowth sometimes uh, scares people. So what is degrowth? Degrowth means basically reducing the metabolism, you know, of our society, reducing productivism and consumerism to focus in investing into social and ecological well-being, into human flourishing beyond uh, profit growth or GDP growth. It means basically prioritizing, you know, human health and other species well-being, so beyond humans and um, ecosystem and ecosystem services, you know, and their functioning. Um, so it seems very obvious, you know, when you talk to people and you, you, you even don't mention the word degrow, people say, of course, that's what, you know, society should work towards. But the reality is that it's not like this. So uh, there's a lot of, of misunderstanding and, you know, uh, many of my colleagues like uh, Timothy Parik and others, they, they write a lot about degrowth and they try to explain that degrowth is not austerity measures, you know, degrowth is not collapse, degrowth means planning for an economy that works for you know most of human being and for ecosystems and and that planning is the central part you know some people also during the pandemic they they almost um, you know, mention degrowth in relationship to COVID and the pandemic and the, you know, sometimes authoritarian or like non-democratic decision that have been taken around the world, but that's not degrowth, you know, even all the austerity measure that we saw with, you know, the crisis in Greece or in other government, that's not degrowth, you know, it, actually degrowth is all the opposite is how can we plan the economy in a different way so that we, you know, avoid to get to those crises, you know. I, um, I was just in Morocco last week, but in, also in Australia, sometimes there's water restriction already, you know, in so many areas in the world. So degrowth means, what can we use this water for? Do we need to produce all these, you know, uh, products? Can we can we rethink what we need to produce and consume? Can we rethink the water in this case that is needed for that production so that everyone can access the water rather than then you know having restrictions? So Degro means rethinking the economy, producing yes for human needs. What do we really need? Do we need a, 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 and and again, this seems so all obvious, but if you look at the history of the economy, that's not that obvious. You know, since the Second World War, we produced a lot of products. And in the 70s, 80s, industrial designers, they got taught to design for plan obsolescence, you know? And plan obsolescence means to design products such as, you know, smartphones, well, at that time, not still a smartphone, but printers, fridges, et cetera, so that the product would break down and people would buy new ones, you know. Obviously, if people buy more products, then companies and shareholders, uh, you know, gain more capital. But if we think about it, that, you know, overproduction of products, it, it involves that ecological and social costs, you know, it, it involves labor exploitation in other countries and you know other resources so degrowth means rethinking our needs rethinking our values and objectives as society and it can be taken from you know a different perspective that like degrowth incorp incorporates a lot of uh, parts as i said before linked to packaged food uh, do we need to work that much you know why are we working that much is it you know to consume more is it to you know pay these uh, over exploited <laughs> rents that people have to uh, pay so um, yeah the is a very holistic new economic framework that basically wants a society that fits within the planet limits and also you know achieve some more social justice
I love it. Yeah. There, Tim Jackson is the author in both of his books. He was in uh, Post Growth is the last one he wrote, and then Prosperity Without Growth from Tim Jackson. And he's actually from the CUSP organization that is all about degrowth as well. And he was also on the podcast. So you're, uh, you're in good company with, uh, with uh, what you're talking about, but I want to dive in even deeper because um, you mentioned in the beginning, as you, as you're kind of explaining it to us that a lot of people get uh, fearful about degrowth and and, um, post-growth and uh, about the, just, just about the terminology that, and then, um, and then you kind of talked about, uh, you didn't say it exactly, but you said reducing, but, but it's almost reductionism. And so I think we need to address that because when, when you start telling people, which goes back to capitalism and consumerism and, and growth, um, when we tell people to reduce, they feel like they're going to lose out on something. And um, I think degrowth and post-growth can uh, we can ha- still have some regeneration, but we allow the planet to uh, regenerate itself to produce enough products. I mean, there there is that old principle uh, in living systems that one plus one never equals two it's uh, that it's actually beyond an exponential because uh of the stewardship and the time of regeneration and let let the planet kind of recoup and that we're creating things as you also mentioned of planned in obsolescence where we're creating building products that are cradle to grave they're one-way systems we use them once and then they go to this landfill and on a planet of finite resources that's never possible but how do we close that loop how do we close that system where we say well i have i have to reduce and plan on a day in the future where i'm going to have to go without that or i'm not going to be able to do that is is that what you're saying or is there another model of that i want to go a little bit deeper into that um, before we kind of talk talk a little bit more about some 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 models out there sure so first of all, yeah, thanks for mentioning the book um, of Tim Jackson, Prosperity Without Growth, because that was that and other publication are really important milestone to understand what post-growth is about. And what's most important in that book in, you know, in relation to this uh, discussion right now is that growth and prosperity don't mean the same thing. And unfortunately, we are still led to believe through you know, media and governments that growth means prosperity, that growth means well-being. And again, just in reference to the pandemic, you know, when we suffered the crisis, the social economic uh, crisis around the world, um, all the, you know, the titles where we need to re-stimulate growth, you know, our countries are not uh, growing enough. And if we step back, it's like, wait, are we working towards social and ecological well-being or growth? You know, so the first principle is prosperity doesn't equal, you know, growth. You know, we can have a prosperity that is not growth based. And that's a first thing. Uh, I completely agree. And thanks for pointing out that. Yes, I said that we need to reduce, you know, the resources. We need to reduce the economic activity and metabolism. And, and probably that is a... Um, I think that we need also to improve, or I need to improve as, as academic in in the um, divulgation of what degrowth means, because when we are led, you know, since the Second World War, we are led to think that growth and increasing is always positive. So suddenly, uh, decreasing or reducing it, it, it means something negative. We can say that degrowth means increasing the well-being, improving the well-being, and it's interesting. Well, maybe because of my um, uh, biological background, I always talk about the apoptose, which is the programmed death of cells. So when we are fetus, for example, we have skin, you know, through our our, our um, fingers, and then the cells are programmed to die so that we have a functioning hand, you know. So that programmation of reduction is not always negative, you know. It depends what the outcome and the purpose is. So, you know, uh, it's true that we we think that reducing something means. Um, 
you know, something negative, but I guess that missing out or less or, you know, suffering somehow, you know. Yeah, but again, you know, in reference to the pandemic, reducing for the privileged one, you know, reducing uh, commuting time or, you know, working from home or just having more time to cook, it was actually a good thing. But uh, yeah, so degree is about in increasing well being. From a material point of view, if we don't overproduce, if we don't produce all these object, gadget, you know, how, how do we access them? Do we need to change our lifestyle completely? Well, no, there are other ways to reorganize society. Taking the example of the Brisbane Tool Library, which is an organization I found in 2017, and is literally a, a library of things where people can borrow hand and power tools, camping gear, kitchen appliances, party appliances. There are many tool libraries in Canada, in the US, more and more in, in Europe as well, in Australia and elsewhere. Um, so if we, two libraries, you know, they obviously give access to tools and other items, but the interesting part is that they teach a different way of using and accessing things. You know, they prioritize access over ownership. So we don't need to own everything. We don't all need a lawnmower. We don't all need a camping tent, you know, we don't all need, a, you know, party appliances. And that introduces us to the fact that if you reorganize society in communities, we can introduce new models, right? For example, uh, we talk about use rights. People have, you know, they don't miss out on any experience. They can still go camping and hiking and organizing parties, but the, the material consumption is reduced because we're not producing for each individual the same amount of, you know, uh, objects. And this is like a small example on how communities can be reorganized accessing the resources, the resources, having equal opportunities, and at the same time, reducing that, you know, uh, material aspects of the economy, dematerializing the economy as per the growth principles. And, in, and, and that is like, you know, when I say that two libraries and in my work, I work towards recreating the commons. The commons is not just about you know, accessing things. It's not just about shared resources. It's about the human relationship that suddenly you develop, you know, because you fight loneliness, because you're involved in knowing your community, your suburb, your people in your city. And, and that's probably the biggest value that we can see with the Brisbane Tool Library. You know, we became a family. The volunteers are, you know, a part of a larger community that creates that community resilience beyond the Tool Library itself, you know. So I like to take the example in, in, internally of the Brisbane Tool Library. If someone has a birthday party, if someone needs to move house and everything, there's like a team of people that raises hands to come up and help, you know. So the commons is about that human relationship that unfortunately through um, commodity production, capitalism broke because that's the only way to sell us products that we don't really need. I'm a big fan and student of Herman Daly and the ecological economics, steady state economics and, and studied with him and, and um, am a big proponent of that. So we've, we've mentioned post-growth and degrowth, and we've, we've talked about some of these other economic models. Um, most people don't even know um, that there's other economic models out there. Um, some have heard of the circular economy, some have heard of um, ecological economics or uh, donut economics from Kate Roworth or mission economics, but there are actually 21 at least that I know of and more coming every single day ecological economic models out there um, and with new ones popping up every single day you mentioned another one the shared economy there's a platform economy there's a planetary boundaries there's an ecological footprint uh, economy model um, and and they go on and on uh, so my question is are we operating them all at the same time? Are we doing one? Are we doing five at the same time? Does it depend on your community? Um, how do we understand that? How does that system work? And is, is degrowth combined with other economic models? How, how does that work? How do we set up something like this in these communities? I, I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, of the, the, 
tool library and, and other forms like that, that I don't want to call it the shared economy, but I do car sharing. I do tons of other sharing things in, in communities where things that I don't use every day that I, you know, I, I don't need every day uh, to, I don't need to feel that ownership that I gladly give to the commons and to the community to use. Um, and it's just a, it's a better model. And it's also this, you mentioned it before, it's this built, built in obsolescence tends to, if we continually lease something, we know we can have it always and we can have the latest version of it and the best version of it. And it's one that doesn't go to the graveyard somewhere that'll be refurbished, recycled or improved for the latest model. Um, I like that model. I'm, I, one of my mentors is uh, Bill McDonough, William McDonough, who wrote Cradle to Cradle and Upcycling and the Circular Economy. So I like those circular models. What's your views and, and well, how are we to make sense of all these economic models out there? Yes, indeed, there are like many names of, you know, concept, but I would say that there's just two models out there. And one is a growth driven model and one is that there's not growth driven model, which can be a deep growth for a steady state economy. So steady state economy means just that we reach, you know, an equilibrium and, and, and we need to degrow to reach that equilibrium. And, and just I will jump back to the part you mentioned before about, you know, people being afraid of, you know, decreasing, you know, in, in, in any aspect of their life while I reformulated that definition in increasing well-being, right? The other um, maybe argument that comes out when we talk about degrowth is like, but global South countries, you know, poor countries need to grow and need to develop. And it's true. And that's why global North countries need to, you know, reduce their consumption so that we uh, allow for material space for this country to build their infrastructure and to reach the basic needs that we need. So degrowth doesn't mean that everyone has to degrow. It doesn't even mean that every sector has to degrow. It means that some aspects of our society need to be reduced and some other needs to be, you know, increased. So degrow just means rethinking the purpose of our society. Said that, so there's a, a growth driven model which is mainly fueled by capitalism. So production of things or others or offering of services just for capital accumulation. And then there's a degrowth post-growth um, perspective, which means ecological and social well-being. Once we frame these, then they're like all these other models you mentioned unfortunately get co-opted a lot by one or the other system right so just to talk about the circular economy the circular economy it's a great if you look at the surface it's a great um concept it's easy to digest it means we we live in a linear economy everything is disposable we need to change that and do something with the end products right and that's a problem that's a problem of the circular economy now it it just became a synonym of green growth, meaning, yes, we need to grow, but in a green way. And that means uh, a, that, you know, people pushing for that circular economy model are pushing for a relative decoupling, which means producing more and more things, but just doing it more sustainably. But data shows that, you know, capitalism has never been against producing more efficiently. Actually, all the opposite, right? If capitalists can reduce resources and increase capital for, for the same product, you know, and they would do it. So what we really need is an absolute decoupling, which means we need to absolutely reduce it, um, the, the material uh, resources that we're using currently. And that's not happening. Um, the other problem of the circular economy and, you know, the Ellen McCarter Foundation and all these organizations are pushing for a circular economy. But if you look at it, they're all very technocratic solutions, you know, saying we need uh, eco design, we need to design the products better, we need uh, um, uh, to transform the material at the end of the life and reuse the materials, but none of those uh, concept, especially of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is, you know, the institution leading the circular economy conversation nowadays, they, no one says that we need to actually just decrease consumption. They just continue pushing for the idea that society needs to be based on infinite production and consumption, but just doing it more sustainably. And, and, 
And that is missing out, you know, a whole part of, you know, respecting the climate boundary we mentioned before, but also the circular economy as in the mainstream understanding of it is missing of the social aspect, you know, where, which role do they have human in this uh, circular economy? You know, we can see these uh, uh, big uh, fast fashion companies that, you know, they use this uh, term as well to greenwash and like bring us back your products and we're gonna, you know, uh, circulate them, we're gonna recycle, we're gonna reuse them. But I don't want to bring my clothes so that they're sent, you know, in India, in Bangladesh, in other poor countries where, you know, kids or women underpaid have to un undo the you know the, the textiles you know so who is profiting from the circular economy what is this circular economy all about so obviously we can use the term circular economy but the question is is it the circular economy for growth or for you know a degrowth steady state a decoupling yeah Yes, so it's like who is profiting from the circular economy? You know, it's always a good question to you know understand who's making most of you know economic advantage out of it, and if that answer is the same company that is producing the product or you know or a similar uh, um, organization, then it's a wrong model. And unfortunately, you know, the good thing about using big growth as a term, and even if it might seem a radical, you know, term, um, which is a radical term, and I'm very proud of using, is that is hardly being co-opted by capitalists because you can't, you know, be capitalist and support deep growth. And again, um, English native speakers and my mother tongue is Italian um, are always afraid of this, uh, you know, the word of being radical about something. But radix is a word that in Latin means root. So, you know, being radical means changing the root of something. So, you know, we have also to understand where words come from. So deep growth is a very radical stance of changing the current and purpose of the economic system. Oh, I absolutely love that. That's perfect. Um, the, the, the way you've put it is so eloquent and so spot on. I really appreciate uh, you breaking that down for us and helping us understand it more. Uh, um, it's so important because we need to have these discussions and we need to talk, uh, uh, take the systems view approach to get into the depth and substance behind a lot of these terms and things that we're hearing so, so that we can understand them a lot better. Um, before we get off the economic topic and growth, uh, totally, I have one last kind of a... <clears throat> spark that I want to address and I don't know if you followed it or how much you've heard in 2018 uh, John Elkington who wrote the book Green Swans he's also the one who came up with people planet and prosperity profit um, model the triple bottom line for um, the earth in 2018 after 25 years of the triple bottom line he recalled it he says we're using it as an, a, 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 an accounting principle and you're greenwashing, you're missing the boat. I'm recalling this. And he still hasn't, when, when a product gets recalled, they usually fix it or they do something or say, oh no, and, and they never come out with it, but normally they fix it and then they re-release it. He still hasn't re-released what, what the new model is that somewhere in the re-imperatives, reuse, recycle, repurpose, regenerate, something in there. But in his book, The Green Swans, and in, in this whole process, he's, he's right on the cover says regenerative capitalism. And I love John. He was on the podcast as well. Um, but I don't think we're aligned on regenerative capitalism. I'm, I'm totally against capitalism, period. <laughs> and the, the growth that it puts there and what it's done for so, so far. But I wanted to know a couple of things, what you think about that. Is there such a thing as regenerative capitalism? Is, is that even possible? Is that just another uh, term to throw on there to, to, to fool us all to, into uh, uh, continuing business as usual. 
Yes. So first of all, uh, you know, regenerative capitalism or green capitalism, you know, it's just a way to sugarcoat the, you know, the, the current system trying to um, make it look greener. So it's greenwashing, pure greenwashing. And again, when I say greenwashing means, you know, stating something that, you know, a sustainability aspect of a product or for a system that doesn't really exist. And again, uh, happy to, you know, uh, comment on social media or wherever this is going to be published. They're like that about how much companies and, you know, government are spending on greenwashing campaign. You know, it's an actual fact, it's a marketing strategy. Um, look, don't get me wrong, capitalism had his time. Capitalism brought, you know, uh, many advantages, but uh, at the expenses of someone else, you know, and that is someone else can be different population, different uh, social statuses within a country, different ecological aspects. Um, I don't think that, you know, regenerative capitalism would lead us anyway, because the purpose of that is going to remain capital accumulation, you know, and, and even, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing in the social entrepreneurship uh, um, area, which again, social entrepreneurship is also another, you know, uh, social washing word, um, but you know, people, planet, and profit. But that's not true because it it it's simple. You know, it, you don't need to be uh, an economist to understand that if there is that profit, if there is that growth, like in the seed in the sustainable development goal, then that's gonna have to you know be at the expenses. Uh, the expenses of people and profit. So if I want to produce something and I want to make a profit, then I have to underpay someone, uh, um, relocalize in a country that has, you know, uh, less environmental and social legislation. I have to externalize uh, the environmental costs. So you cannot have a profitable society that it's also sustainable. So you can't uh, accumulate capital uh, for the few you know, in that sense. Uh, unfortunately, there, there are so many other theories out there that are um, unexplored, you know, and beyond the naming of, you know, the um, economic system, uh, you know, capital is obviously money is, we are in a money-based society, but we can introduce ways of circulating, you know, that money. There's, there was a Silvio Gesell that already, you know, two centuries ago, ago was talking about, you know, introducing money that expires. And especially it was a, a origin from Germany and um, migrated in Argentina. And, and Gesell was saying that we need money that expires, especially in a crisis, which means that at that point, obviously, they didn't have all the digital uh, technology that we have today. But I found it fascinating that we never uh, explored more in depth that idea. So he was saying that if money has an end date, a deadline, you know, like our yogurt or other products, then people are obliged to make it circulate. So, you know, people would spend it that people would use it and, and capital would flow. And if people want to accumulate uh, that capital, the money, he was saying they would need to pay to reactivate that money. So it would cost you more to accumulate and to flow that, right? But there's also, you know, more modern, great women macroeconomists um, and they're looking at other ways to, you know, um, pay, you know, for social and ecological well-being. For example, without taxing people, because that's another problem, right? When we talk about these great social and ecological goals, we're always afraid that we need to pay for it, and you know, taxes are a big burden, etc. But uh, for example, there's um, the entrepreneurial state, which is a book I would recommend, or like, how can we, you know, uh, tax differently companies and not people? You know, how can you know eventually, if we want to keep the intellectual property? make a corporation pay for infrastructure and social ecological well-being so capitalism has to you know we need to shift away from capitalism and we need to not be afraid of it because unfortunately and i can see it in my generation you know my brother is younger than me the the most um, the thing that scares more capitalists is that we imagine a different society. And in fact, if all you know, these social media and digital tools, etc., they're trying to kill our imagination. They're trying to let us think that capitalism is the only way to do it, you know. But again, capitalism is what, 200 years old? And humanity is longer than that. And across the world, we have different populations that manage, you know, society in different ways with gift economies and different models so there are other models that needs to be explored and I think 
you know, me and you, I don't know if you're going to see the end of it. Hopefully I will try to, um, you know, have a, a, an influence in that change. But I think that, uh, yeah, capitalism, and again, sorry, just to finish, um, you were talking about the circular economy and reusing and refurbishing things and this push of, you know, putting a value on waste and parts is just because capitalism is dying and they need to find new markets so they're saying well we sell you your phone that's still gonna break down but we can repair it for you and resell it because they need to expand the market so that you know capital keep accumulating for the top one percent yeah it's uh, it's it's an it's insanity but yeah I, I appreciate you going deeper and explaining that uh for us We've talked about communities and how vital communities are and, and to build those as well as in the sharing how, how that builds society and a community as well. There's another um, economic model that we really haven't talked about. It's basically from Helena Norberg Hodge. She also contributes in the book, but it's about local futures and local economies, how we, we make sure to sustain ourselves first and kind of build these local economies of goods and produce ourselves and, and have that when I sustainability is, is a, has many definitions and is not a legal term and by by any means, but um, to sustain our community, our societies, our organization over time with goods, with resources, with with however that society functions. Is, is a fabulous model that I really like and I've seen work in, in, in many, many ways before. And the other one is the one that we deal with with agriculture and food. An agrarian society, uh, I used to say is you know 13,000 years old. Now we're getting um, word that it might even be 20,000 years old. And it's the, the basis of how all civilizations started, how cities and communities and cultures grew based around um, our food and this community, this really this community. And then as they, they've gotten bigger over the years, we've kind of pushed them out into the skirts, outskirts and outsourced that infrastructure, that basic need uh, elsewhere. And so I, I wanna know, <clears throat> Is, is this local economy really, in your mind, a, a, just another form of steady state, another way of degrowth and bringing back that to, to local areas? Or what's your thoughts and feelings on, on that uh, direction as well? Yeah, so, well, the work of the local future organization is really important because as I often explain in my work, there's, you know, we, and it goes probably back to the beginning of our conversation, where do we need to catalyze change from a top down level or bottom up? And I spoke about communities, which is what local future does as well. And that's the meso level, you know, we never mentioned the meso level, you know, we are very focused on individuals or the macro level, but because of, you know, a government that are influenced by big lobbies, we are not, you know, they're not working for us anymore, generally speaking. And individuals, we, we, we mentioned that it's hard to act as an individual. So suddenly that meso level, you know, becomes the, the connecting part and probably the more important part. Um, I don't like to romanticize, you know, working with community, you know, it's always and also, in, you know, people working in this uh, organization, we always romanticize working with communities is great. And people usually generally <laughs> you know, like the idea, except then when you have to work with other humans, human sucks, right? <laughs> and, and that's where the challenge is. But again, we have to, you know, unlearn you know to put our ego to pay, to put you know and this is nothing wise i'm saying but it's really an exercise or, you know and and unfortunately we lost that um exercise of uh, exercise of collaborating because of you know two centuries of influence of you know neoliberal society and um and you know, I just give you a practical example. When I started the, the Brisbane Tool Lab in 2017, I spoke at many conferences. People came to visit the Tool Library, and one recurrent question from the public and visitors was, "What if someone steals the tools and doesn't return them?" And that made me think a lot because it was a really recurrent question. And then I started answering that 
Well, 99% of people are good people. Let's start with that, you know. So if, I, as I was saying, if you had that in question in mind, maybe it means you would do it. And people would go, oh, no, 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 I just talked about it, right? So I think that we, you know, this neoliberal society that put us to compete for resources that, you know, creates scarcity, because that's what capitalism does, you know, create profitable scarcity and make us compete for them when in reality there's abundance for everyone. And that, you know, and that meso level means having faith that other humans are as good as we are. And, and obviously, you know, crimes and other things happen. And sometimes people are pushed by different reasons to do that. But I think that that meso level, working with community, the question is like, how can we move away from a system that creates scarcity and make us pay for, you know, what we need to a system that creates abundance for all? How can we, you know, access abundance? How can we recreate the commons? And although the, you know, the pandemic had a, dis a disastrous effect on many aspects of our life. It showed us that relocalizing the economy give us resilience, you know? We saw that when, you know, the global market uh, stops, we start lacking of main products, etc. So, yeah, I think that, you know, that local futures or other projects or initiative like the slow food movement do is, you know, keeping that authenticity of, you know, the local territories and that resilience of community. And again, you know, in Australia, there's Aboriginal people that they are the um, longest uh, living culture in the world and they didn't have a capitalist society in place and they had you know regenerative societies that you know lived well within the proper environment so i think that just keeping up the idea that a different society can exist is probably the most important you know job that we have to do right now i love that and i i totally agree with you that you know there's that um, that thought process of scarcity or someone's going to steal something from you and, and uh, what if they steal it or what if they don't return it in time or it's return it broken. Th those are things locally that we need to uh, have an insurance plan for, have, have a plan for that, you know, things happen, you know, things break down, but how can we work with more more systems or more organizations that build a product that lasts forever, builds a, builds products, you know, that, you know, you um, have it your whole life. I, I still wear clothes from junior high school, believe it or not, um, which is highly suspect. I have things from, from my childhood still that I use almost every day and they're in great condition. And this, this whole community thing, the other thing that you really, you addressed, which which we need to talk about, and I, we're kind of running out of time, but we've got, we've got. I really want to make sure we touch upon these. Is you you brought up neoliberalism, and it's hard not to bring up neoliberalism and neo Darwinism at the same time. And I I usually talk about it on most of my podcasts anyway, and so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it's non-existent. This 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 human condition or this idea that we've gotten into that uh, the way the world works is through neoliberalism or neo-Darwinism, this competition, this survival of the fittest, natural selection, only the strong survive, severe competition. Somebody's going to steal from you. Somebody's going to try to outcompete you or take something away from you. Um, this fear of reductionism, fear of reducing or um, going without something um, that uh, is ingrained in a lot of the systems and structures of our world. It, it, when I say it's non-existent, um, it's definitely existent in, in, in our world, but it's, uh, it's non-existent in the fact is it's not real. That's not how the world works. It's not how the world has ever worked naturally. And I don't know how, um, if you know a lot about Lynn Margulis or um, uh, Boris Koplov or, or any of the other great scientists out there that have writ written about symbiosis or specifically um, the model and the way that our world works. And that, that model is a question that I'm going to ask you here in just a moment, but it's really um, our, our world doesn't work in competition, natural selection, fighting against one each other, only the strong survive. 
That's something that has never existed in our world. And it's a misunderstanding of Darwin. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of how we structure our organizations and business. The way that our world truly works and functions and scientifically proven, it's proven over uh, uh, all life is that it works in harmony and collaboration and cooperation and symbiosis with microorganisms, with other species, and um, including Homo sapien uh, in a much different way. And so I, I wanted to touch on that because you mentioned neoliberalism, but it's also your time to kind of um, address your thoughts or feelings on, on that as well. Uh, when you answer this question, and the, it's the hardest question I have for you today, uh, um, it's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? All right. So before just getting on that, I wanted to introduce sure. to one extra notion you were saying about, you know, your clothes that you kept for many years. And that is also in the book, Curing Affluenza, they introduce a important definition of being materialistic and being consumeristic. And sometimes we use the, these terms as synonymous, but you know, I like the definition that in, included in the book. Uh, being consumeristic, uh, consumerist means you know, uh, having the love of buying, of shopping, the thrill of you know, buying new things, while being materialistic means loving the materials, you know, the, the things. And um, so the book says that if we're really materialistic and we love things, we have to you know, keep them, to maintain them. And that's what you know, our parents or grandparents used to do, right? To, you, to maintain good quality of things and then pass it down to the next generation. While I think that I probably won't pass anything down that, because everything that is produced is already disposable from clothes to you know, digital technology. So just that on clothes. Um, I won't comment specifically on you know, neoliberalism and neo-Darwinism, but um, I'm aware of it and I have many colleagues I work on showing that from an ecological biological perspective you know most species collaborate you know and that that uh, competition is an artifact to justify the economic system that we live in but because it's not my area of expertise i'd rather not uh, go into depth in there but that idea of competition is a really important one because obviously it relates to the um, scarcity, the created scarcity we mentioned. But it also, and that's probably you know from a feminist point of view, uh, an interesting subject that sometimes you know is uh, spoken about in the media and stuff about you know if women wants to be equal to men, they have to compete, they have to adopt, you know that, and, and that's again setting up in a patriarchal society, saying well if you want gender equality you need to be like men, you know, you need to compete while, you know, again, uh, businesses or society can have other values, you know, they can have empathy, they can have collaboration and more um, anarcho horizontal structure. And, and that would also mean success, right? If everyone <laughs> works uh, together. So that idea of competition and scarcity in capitalism uh, is also entrenched with, you know, uh, patriarchy and and that's what probably the feminist economics and again I'm not an expert in there but I'm happy to eventually suggest some guest speakers they can talk more about uh, to introduce another term you know feminist economics and how that could you know uh, give more importance to care you know the work of care which is also not included in GDP right because if we care about our community as volunteers if we care about our elders about our kids none of that is included in GDP so in growth you know it's more convenient for a government to send you to work and send your children to childcare and pay for it than for you to educate and keep your children at home so yes you know is a uh, Again, maybe going back to the beginning, it's it's a big system problem that we have, and I think you know to maybe simplify a little bit all these topics that we discussed is the main question is, what's the purpose you know of our society? Is it working for our well being or is it working for you know profit? You mentioned is how would the society works for everyone look like? And that's I mainly another... want to know for you. I want to know what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not so. Yeah, not yeah. your university, but you, I want to know what your thoughts are. And if you, if I'm sure you've thought about this in many different ways, what would that look like? What, the, 
direction or how should we be looking or focusing? Kind of set that vision for us. Yeah, look, I'm I'm a very realistic, rational person, and probably I would love to have more, you know, in, imagination or futuristic imagination. But um, I know great, you know, people out there that have more of that long term imagination. What I think. I'm doing and working towards is just providing some kind of basic needs and prosperity for people in that basic needs, you know, we're not talking about, you know, big things, you know, access to, you know, shelter, food, accommodation, equal opportunity, the, cho- you know, the choice. We, I want everyone to have, you know, uh, good prosperity, a good level of life so that they can make choices that they want to, you know, to then reach that kind of, happiness and that is not happening yet and you know again back to food systems we have increasing since 2014 if i report properly from a fio report uh, hunger increased again and at the same time we have obesity obesity increasing so obviously we are in disequilibrium and providing just those basic needs and accessing those basic needs that's what I really want to work towards and focusing. And then I will support other people that have more creative ideas on how society should be redesigned. I love that. Yeah, uh, we could probably have a whole nother podcast just on some some form of uh, twist on not universal basic income, but universal basic rights for everyone that those, those bare necessities for people and humanity are really covered and intrinsically built into our economic models, but into our community and society structures so that we're not worrying about those things and can strive and create and, and live the full potential that that I hope we're all meant to, to live. And Mark, uh, we talk uh, yeah. about that in another podcast because we often mention basic income, but we rarely men- mention income caps. <laughs> so that's yeah. probably another... <laughs> question to I, I don't even I, I I'm totally against UBI and universal basic income uh, I think it's I mean um, Nixon tried it and it's been around for a long time and there's some things that we saw COVID during COVID that really worked worked good but I, I think we need to do a twist on that that doesn't really involve um, income or growth in, in that respect it, it uh, it's more of a basic right of um, security, shelter, food, the, the basics for each and every human being on earth. And, and I, yeah, that's a whole nother podcast, but I, we definitely need to talk about it when, when the book comes out and, and uh, um, uh, we'll definitely need to get on another podcast and go into an even deeper dive. I have two last questions for you. These are more so for my listeners as kind of a sustainable takeaway for them if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners that was like a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life or shift them in another way of seeing the world, what would that message be? And it's okay if it's even a couple messages. Yeah, it's, you know, kind of question. And I'm always feel I'm not the appropriate person to answer those questions because I feel it puts you like on a level of wisdom that I don't believe I have, right? But uh, I think that we really, you know, if I try to think about something which probably is not very wise anyway, I think that, you know, I was saying before, capitalism is killing our imagination. So if we need to fight for something is to fight for, you know, a different word. So we, we need to imagine, you know, that different word and it can be as crazy as, you know, utopic as we want it, but to try and keep that open imagination is everything. And, uh, and then from there, we're just going to work backward and try to, you know, develop some action and plans to achieve that imagination or idea of ideal society. Yeah, I don't know too many creative or imaginative bankers out there or people with lots of capital. There's very few out there. The last question is, what have you experienced or learned in this professional journey of yours so far that you would have said, boy, I wish I would have known that from the start. I wish I would have known that it would change my path. Um, Is there anything like that? You get cut off a lot, you know, talking about, you know, criticizing capitalism, 
you know, it's a taboo topic, even if in some countries it's easier to talk about it than in others. Um, talking about greenwashing, pointing out and being critique of your own sector, right? You know, uh, I worked in the social enterpr enterprise sector in Australia and and yes, you get cut off a lot. And for a little bit, I'm very, I'm a very direct person. I thought that maybe I had to moderate, you know, my critique of the system. But I went back to my, you know, steps and thinking that we don't have time anymore because every time we don't speak up, you know, someone else is suffering. So uh, that's a risk to take, you know, to get cut off, to 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 get more obstacles, or you know, is a challenging path and. And that's how it should be, you know, change has never been easy. And in, if it's too easy, then we're not pushing hard enough. And so I guess that, uh, yeah, I, I thought I had to moderate or be more politically correct at a certain point in my life. But then I went back to embrace my radicality. I love it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for letting all of us uh, inside of your ideas. This has been a great podcast and I look forward to future conversations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark, thanks everyone for your time in this meeting.